All right. Hello, everyone. Um, right. My, my name is Lindsay Sharman. I'm the curator of the Art Gallery of Alberta. Um, so today with Carfac Alberta, we are hosting a session on calls for submissions and open calls uh, with Chris Carson from Carfac Alberta and Suying Strang. Hello. Um, so the AGA and I are situated on Treaty 6 territory. Uh, we are also in Edmonton, the traditional land of diverse Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Inuit, and Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis people who make their homes on territories that intersect the current borders of Alberta. Treaty 6 was signed uh, in 1876. Uh, exactly 20 years later, my great-great-grandmother came here from what was then Russia um, to a home just a few blocks east uh, from where I'm sitting right now. Um, and one block north of me right now, you'll find uh, Chris Carson <laughs> uh, with undergraduate studies completed at the University of Alberta and an MFA in painting from UBC. Chris is both a professional visual artist and arts administrator. His career includes exhibitions at public artist run and commercial galleries throughout Alberta. As an administrator, Carson worked for commercial um, arts organizations. Uh, and since uh, August 2010, Chris has been the executive director of Carfac Alberta. Um, Sue Ying String is joining us uh, from Treaty 7. She's an artist and culture worker based in Mokinstis, Calgary. Originally hailing from the southern United States, Strang relocated to Treaty 7 territory in 2006 to pursue her arts education uh, at what is now AU Arts. Strang has been involved in not-for-profit art sector uh, since 2010 and is a graduate of the inaugural cohort of BAM Center's Cultural Leadership Program in 2017 and the Rosé Arts Management Program in 2016. Strang currently serves um, as the director of the new gallery and as a governor on uh, the board of Glenville Museum. And it was just announced yesterday, um, she'll be moving down to Lethbridge to become director of the Southern Alberta Art Gallery. So congratulations on that <laughs> addition to your bio. <laughs> um, so before we get into it, uh, I'd like to thank uh, EPCOR uh, and Canada Council for their support. Um, our online programming is brought to you because of the generous support of the EPCOR Heart and Soul Fund. And of course, a huge thank you to Heartback Alberta for working with us um, on this event um, and partnering with us. Um, so your way of interacting with Sue and Chris throughout this event is through the chat. Um, we'll take your questions at the end, but you don't need to wait that long. Um, as soon as a question comes up, um, you're fine to just put it in the chat and, and I'll monitor throughout and make sure that we get to all those great questions. So Chris is going to start us off. Um, he's going to give a little presentation for us. Then we'll hand it over to Sue. Um, and then we'll take all of your wonderful questions. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to just hand it over to Chris. OK, thank you very much. And I'm just waiting for, OK, ah, so. I'm Chris Carson. I'm the executive director of Carfac Alberta. And thank you, Lindsay, for the excellent introduction. And what I'm going to do tonight is just probably talk to you about a few simple concepts. First of all, what are call for submissions? And, you know, call for submissions are something that an art gallery, a museum, a university, uh, granting agency might send out when they are seeking new material. Now, all these galleries, institutions are probably more likely to select work if it is something that they are looking for. That's probably an introduction to kind of what is a call for submissions. So what are they used for? 
They're used for group exhibitions, for gallery programming, for public galleries, for artist-run centers, for commercial galleries. They're used for the acquiring or the purchasing of artwork that could be from some kind of funding agency like the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, uh, all these places that buy artwork. Uh, the, for, they're used for commissions and for public art. So all this 1% art programs, they put out a call to see what is out there. Calls are also used for fundraisers. Now, I suppose the idea comes, what makes a good call for submission? And I think there's one word that we really have to focus on, and that's the word transparency. Transparency means that a call for submission would probably answer some of these questions that you do have, like who, what, when, where, why, and how. Would the call for submission tell you how, you know, some of the questions I want to know, how much am I going to be paid uh, if the work is accepted? Will the artwork be insured by the organization? Now, you have to begin to say after, if some of your questions have been answered, you will then begin to decide, is this a good opportunity for me to pursue? So there's lots of calls out there. Some might be directed at something specific. As I said before, a call, a gallery is more likely to select the work if it's something they are looking for initially. That's one of the things that we have to think about. Is the call worth it? OK, so we're going to decide we're going to submit or not. You need to re do some research about the organization, about the call itself. And we have to begin to decide how closely this call aligns with best practices. Okay, what are best practices then? Best practices are professional guidelines for an interaction between an artist and somebody who engages with an artist. So they include Carfac Alberta on our website. That's carfacalberta.com. They have a, which I'll give you on the next slide. I'll show you exactly where. But they actually have, we have a series of seven best practice documents that are for media, craft, and visual artists in Alberta. And they kind of, these best practice documents provide individuals with clear parameters or or ground rules for how things should happen, who should behave in what sort of way. It's kind of like rules on what should possibly happen. Okay, so as I say, we have best practices for contracts, agreements, and negotiations, best practices for the use of artists' work, for fundraising, best practices for working with a commercial gallery, for working with a public gallery, for organizing a juried show, best practices for community-based arts, for public art, and then this kind of like glossary of terms and stuff like that. The way to get them is just go to the Carfac Alberta website, carfacalberta.com or this is the exact place where you can download these seven documents at HHTPS, and it goes from there. Ah, okay. So if we're looking at what is a best practice, what do these best practices kind of say about organizing a juried exhibition? Okay, so the first thing, one of the things it would say is that they should actually outline what an artist can expect from this perspective, what an organization is going to do. Um, an artist, like if you're submitting, you have to be ready to work in a professional manner. Organizations have to pay a certain kind of fee, so they agree to pay kind of CARFAC RAV rates for 
exhibiting your work. They have to protect your copyright. So there's a lot of things that this organ, uh, organization would have to do to run a good juried exhibition. Okay. One thing that is probably one of the most important things about best practices is anytime you're doing something, anytime an artist is doing something outside their studio, an, an artist is engaging with somebody, you should always have a contract. Written contracts protect both you as an artist, they would protect the organization who is contracting you. So they protect both sides. They protect both sides from anything that can go wrong because a contract states who is responsible for insurance, who is going to hang the artwork, when are you going to get paid, on what day. Uh, that's what a contract always does. So it, with a contract, you avoid potential conflicts. So um, there's kind of sample contracts that you can get on the website or to places like Carfax Saskatchewan. If somebody does not offer you a contract, then you can say, can I write a contract? Can we write a contract together? A contract does not necessarily have to be something that's a 40 page formal document. Rather, a contract could be even something that you both sit down and record into your iPhone. As long as you are answering all these questions of who, what, when, where, why, and how. So all the things that could happen, if you answer them all, it doesn't have to be formally drawn out and signed by both parties that way. A uh, contract could also be a record of your emails that you keep between an organization. But the best thing to do is have a written contract. Okay. Now, before you submit, are all of your questions answered as to who, what, when, where, why, and how? Does the call follow the best practices? And if they don't follow all the best practices, are the deviations from these best practices acceptable to you? So in other words, um, you know, some sort of call might not actually pay totally the full rates that you see in the Carfax Rev minimum pay schedule. Is that acceptable to you? That's only a question you can answer. But are contracts used? That's a real key to determine if something is professional or not. Okay, so this was just a real brief outline to the kind of idea of calls for submission and the importance of looking and researching things, the best practice documents that you can find to kind of see what are the ground rules? What are the kind of basic sorts of things you should be looking for when you're reading a call? Does this answer them? So always research the call before you decide to submit. It's very important. There's so many things out there. You have to do some research to see if this is a good opportunity for you. So my talk was just a really brief thing. Sue Strang from Calgary, as I say, from the New Gallery, from an artist-run center, is probably going to give you a bit more ideas on the idea of what kind of call should you could you uh, and what kind of call should you apply to? So she's going to talk a bit more about the contextualization and of what your work, what kind of things you should apply for. So anyway, I'm going to just uh, pass you over to Sue Strang right now. Sue, welcome, and uh, we'll be answering questions after this. Thanks, Sue. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Chris. Wow, I'm in awe of your uh, your timing. Ten minutes on the dot. Impressive. 
Um, well, uh, just a quick thanks um, to Chris for co-presenting um, and, and Lindsay for introducing us, moderating, as well as uh, Michael and Helen for organizing behind the scenes in the Art Gallery of Alberta and Carfac Alberta for hosting and inviting me to share with you all today. Super excited always to be able to talk about this because calls for submissions certainly is a large part of how I've operated uh, working in the not-for-profit art sector. So before we dive in though, um, I really, really appreciated Lindsay's introduction and land acknowledgement. And I just wanna give a little bit of a brief personal history as an expansion of that land acknowledgement. And uh, I thank Tim Fox and my colleagues at the Real Faculty Planning Committee um, for sharing this method of really situating myself in this place and time. Um, so I'm a mixed race, uh, second generation Chinese American settler who was born in Tokobaga, Utsita, Kohoi, and Makosa territories um, in the Tampa Bay region of Florida. My maternal line is ethnically Chinese, culturally Malay, with my maternal grandparents immigrating separately from um, China to Malaysia. My paternal side comes from mixed European uh, European American settler background and includes Scottish, German, and English heritage. Um, and my parents met in Sungai Patani in the Kedah state of Malaysia in the 1980s, where they were in the same running club, the Hash House Harriers. And after they got married, they moved to the States and stayed at my parent, uh, my paternal grandparents' uh, house in Pekin, Illinois. Uh, they later relocated to Chicago and escaped the cold, the wind, um, by moving to Valerico, Florida, where my brother, my sister, and I were born. I've since lived in multiple territories all over Turtle Island um, before coming to Mokinstis, Calgary in 2006. Uh, I'm really, really grateful to call Treaty 7 home. And uh, I want to just say that this land that I'm now situated on are the traditional territories of the Nitsitapi or Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes the Gaina, the Bagani, and Siksika First Nations, the Stony Nakoda First Nation, which includes the Gaina, um, excuse me, the Stony Nakoda First Nations, which is comprised of the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations, and then the Sutina First Nation uh, and Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Um, so that's that's a little bit of who I am. Um, you can call me Sue or Sue Ying. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm an artist and cultural worker, as Lindsay shared. And really today, what is today about? We've heard that introduction. We know what calls for submissions are. Chris has done a really, really excellent job covering this. So uh, as he shared, I'm going to speak to how calls for submissions and the application process work. Um, and I'll try to move quickly so we, we have a bit of a fair bit of material to cover today. Um, but what I really wanna start with uh, for us is finding calls for submissions. And um, there's a lot of really great opportunities out there and how do you find them? So these calls are circulating on a lot of different platforms. Uh, in present day, a lot of these platforms are digital platforms that are found online. So that's what you're gonna see mostly listed here. We'll start with e-newsletters. Uh, so things like Akimbo, Instant Coffee, Art and Education, eArt Now, individual organizational in, uh, newsletters. These are all incredible resources that come straight to your inbox and list a lot of really awesome opportunities. Things like Akimbo are more of a Canadian focus. Uh, Instant Coffee lets you subscribe to a regional or provincial based uh, mailing list. Um, things like Art and Education or eArt Now might have a more international base. Um, and individual organizations, of course, are going to be focused on their own calls, but also sometimes they do community uh, roundups and, and will include other opportunities that, of their peer organizations. Um, so I think that these are great places to start because if you don't have a lot of places offhand that you know about, some of the newsletters like Akimbo and Instant Coffee, Art and Education, they're really amalgamating a bunch of different calls, not just for exhibition programs. Maybe there's fellowships or grant programming, maybe there's jobs, things like that. So um, it's a great place to get kind of this all in one overview of what's out there, what's open this month, what's open this week. Um, when you're subscribing to newsletters, I know like inbox inboxes are always full. Um, and so what I would suggest is that if you go and subscribe to these newsletters that amalgamate a bunch of calls, that's really useful. And then be really um, specific in the newsletters that you wanna subscribe to for the various institutions. What are the organizations you love to go to? Um, what organizations have programming that you feel is really, really aligned with your interest and your thinking? Those are pretty good indicators that you should sign up for their e-newsletter and be consistently reading and learning about what kind of opportunities they have upcoming because um, 
if, if you're enjoying the programming, uh, it might be a good fit for you to, to be involved with them as an artist in the future. Um, social media, of course, is, is another big one. Social media has uh, really been an opportunity for a lot of mid and small sized arts organizations to get the word out there really effectively and quickly and really affordably as well. So you'll see a lot of individual institutions um, as well as some of these these organizations that focus on on sharing this content, um, put this material not only out in their e-newsletter, but social media just as another way for folks to connect. Um, so art funders and schools, they're also looking for ways to leverage all of their partners, um, all of their stakeholders, opportunities and programming. So they often include things like classified, um, digital classified ad sections of their website. If you look at Calgary Arts Development, they have a classified section on their website. Edmonton Arts Council also has their community classifieds. Uh, and as an example for post-secondary AU Arts, their student association has a classified section. Um, so all of these are readily, freely available online. And they're a great place to check out fairly regularly um, just to see if there's an organization locally or regionally that maybe you don't follow on social media. Maybe you don't follow or subscribe to their newsletter, but you can see, oh, they have an opportunity coming up. That's a great that's a great one for me to look into. Or maybe I didn't know about that organization before and I should start paying attention to them. Um, another really awesome very useful tool, two of them, uh, is the directory by ARCA and uh, Res Artis. Uh, both of these are web pages. The directory is really focused on artist-run culture and is a, a very robust listing of all the artist-run centers across Canada. So the focus very much is artist-run centers and very much Canada. Um, but it has a lot of really interesting and useful search queries that help you find organizations and opportunities that are a really good match for you. Um, you can search by when do they have their open call, what medium are they focused on their mandate. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there. Same for Res Artis. That focus of the website is residencies. And the focus uh, in terms of geographic scope is international. Um, so that's another really great opportunity to just browse. In, in fact, with that one, you can also um, check off selection uh, query tools like, is this a paid residency or do I have to pay to go to it? So you can quickly start to define what you're looking for and spend your time focused and tailored on, on those opportunities instead of, uh, you know, the significant mass of material that and, and uh, opportunities that exist out there. So um, one of the things, actually, before we move on to um, context, I'll just say a recommendation I have because there's so many great opportunities out there is that you set up a calendar with uh, all the annual calls for submissions that you're interested in. A lot of organizations have a fairly regular kind of calendar of when they put out their call for submission for their programming selection. And so if you make a separate tab on, say, your Google calendar, um, you can have a submissions deadline calendar, put those in for repeating annual activity. And then say you miss it this year, you have a reminder next year that it's coming up and you can um, really hop on that opportunity when it comes around again if it's something that you're excited and interested in because um, there is there is just so much out there you really gotta um, take note and be able to remember when there's something that's a good fit coming coming up so you can prioritize it so prioritization that's when we get to this question of should I submit to this call um, and we've gone a little too far ahead, but we'll, we'll pop here. Um, so now that you're seeing all of these opportunities, which ones are right for you? Uh, honestly, it can be really overwhelming to see the abundance of calls out there. And what will be really key uh, considerations are not only what Chris has shared around best practices um, to determine those opportunities that are the right fit um, for you, but also prioritizing based on your needs and your practice. So what are some of these considerations? Uh, let's start with Really, what is your ideal setting for your work? If you're a performance artist and you uh, want to do time-based work, um, you want to do something in a festival, you need to be looking for that specific type of call. If you're a media artist, you um, might want to focus on, well, a lot of different art or organizations are going to support media arts, but maybe there's specific organizations that really champion that. And those are thing areas where you want to focus um, your attention for applying to those calls for submissions. Um, and then in terms of familiarity with the host organization, have you checked them out? Do you know what they're all about? Um, 
does their mandate align with what your practice and your proposed project are all about? Uh, that would be, I would say, one of the more important factors for many, many juries. There are so many organizations out there, and of course, there's so many artists out there as well. How is this, and how can you talk about this as being um, a great match and outline why it's a good fit, why the context is right, um, to really stand out uh, uh, when it comes to all of those submissions? Um, so context, context, context. Think about that. As Chris said, research everything, understand the organization before you apply. Um, and, and really, if you have limited time, focus your energy on the calls that make sense for your practice, make sense for what you want to do and what you're proposing to do. And, and that will increase your chances of, uh, of having a successful submission. So now you have selected the organizations, the calls for submissions that you actually want to move forward with. Um, how do we create a strong proposal? How do we create a strong submission for this? Uh, I'll just flag that some of these tips, pointers are useful for grant writing as well. Um, and this is by, this is definitely just a brief overview because we, we don't have a ton of time to go deep, deep dive into this, uh, each of these sections, um, but starting with proposal writing. Each proposal you write is gonna be slightly different, even if the project is exactly the same. You really need to think about with the particular organization you're applying to, who is your audience? What is the gallery's or the funder's purpose? Going back to connecting with their mandate, understanding their mandate and what they're trying to do. How can you speak to that through your proposed project? This can help you really focus, I would say, on things like phrasing, um, capturing keywords and ideas that are relevant to your reader, relevant to the jury members when they're trying to determine the shortlist and what projects and proposals are best aligned with the work that they're trying to do. Um, also very, very clear, uh, very, very important, I would say, is to always start with reading that call and guidelines uh, in the case of grants to see if you're eligible. The worst thing would be to go through the process of um, writing the submission and then all of a sudden realize at the end you go back and read the, the call and it's for a specific uh, target group. It's for local artists only. It's for uh, XYZ artists only or um, other eligibility requirements, particularly when you get into funding. Uh, and grant opportunities. So start with that. Another thing you want to do um, is avoid assuming that the jury or the grant officer, even if you know them, even if they're local, uh, don't assume that they know anything about the type of work you do, um, especially because you're not going to know who's on the jury. You want to be as clear and specific as possible and use plain language when you're describing your work. Sometimes the jury, a lot of juries are made up of peers and practicing artists and um, typically that kind of art jargon or vernacular, like there's, there's some resonance there, but really you want to make sure that your ideas, your work cannot be misinterpreted, not misrepresented. So really spend a little bit of time um, thinking through and going, combing through your first, second, third draft and understanding, having another reader take a look at it and seeing if it's clear, um, concise. That's another important part. While you need to outline all those integral details, you also need to be concise. A lot of juries are spending anywhere from 50 to 100 hours reviewing submission packages, and you want to be respectful of their time and, and not go through a lot of repetition. Um, now, when in this proposal, it might also make sense to discuss why this is an important opportunity for you in your art practice. This is where you can, again, really hammer home and tie in this idea of relevance and context to the specific organization that you're applying to. Um, how is it going to help you make or share work if you're applying for a residency or some sort of production-based project? How is it going to help you succeed as an artist? This is what these arts organizations are there for. They want to see the impact on you um, and, and your work. Uh, especially for funders as well. Now, um, finally, with the proposal piece, it has to be a tell a story. It has to be memorable. Uh, all those hours, our jurors and grant officers go through hundreds of applications every year. So you want to make sure that, um, you know, you're true to your, your project, true to your work and practice, but also, um, standing out from, from that, uh, from the rest of those applications and telling, making a compelling case as to why they should present your work or fund your project, um, why it's important to be shown at this time. 
Um, on the other side of proposals, we have artist statements. And um, I mean, most of you uh, as artists are going to know, uh, have artist statements that you've written about your work or as you're creating work. And um, typically they're outlining this, uh, the conceptual elements, the context, the background of why and what this, this practice means to you. Um, the only thing I'll add uh, to artist statements is that a juror should really be able to connect this artist statement to the project aligned in the proposal. Um, you know, occasionally I'll see an artist statement and a proposal that are complete that have no thread connecting them, and that can be difficult. It can be a little bit of um, it can that disconnect can really challenge folks in understanding. Um, all the different holistically why this project is uh, impactful and meaningful to your to your practice and so um, try try to connect those two uh, to a bit again we don't want to have a lot of overlap but we want those two to be in dialogue with one another for support material imagine the person reading your applications has never seen your work include as much support material as as you can um, to illustrate your your proposal make sure it's quality though you, you don't want to include a bunch of uh, the same support material, like slightly different shots, some more blurry, some less blurry, pick the best uh, that you have on hand, but also um, try to give a lot of variety so folks can really get a good sense of your practice. Uh, again, not assuming that they know anything about your work. Um, documentation is one of the most important parts of these submissions. A lot of folks are, you know, as I said, there's a lot of reading to do and, and these images can help your uh, people understand and remember your work when they're talking about it around the adjudication table. Um, if you can hire a professional photographer, I know it's a, a big expense or it can be a big expense. Maybe do a trade with a friend who's a photographer, trade some of your art for them to document uh, an exhibition or your work in your studio, um, just so you have that, that documentation when you go to make these proposals. Um, if you're writing a grant, include documentation on the budget for sure. Um, and if you haven't made the work that you're pitching, um, try to show past work that really illustrates your capacity to successfully make this new project. Uh, I think it's great when folks uh, propose new work that hasn't been made yet, um, but helping demonstrate how you've done a work that is related to what you're proposing can really help build a strong case and uh, um, solidify the jurors, um, your credibility and, and your ability to finish this project in, in the jurors' minds. Um, for budgets, uh, you know, not all exhibitions or, or arts organizations are gonna ask you for a budget. This oftentimes will be needed if you're applying for uh, project funding um, from uh, grantors, but, um, some do, some organizations will ask for a project budget, particularly with larger scale projects or production based projects, things that are a little less straightforward, um, such as residencies, such as production or performance. Um, so at the end of the day, I know budgets can sometimes be a little bit, uh, so sometimes they're easier for folks, sometimes they're harder for folks, but the most important thing is that your expenses matches you, your revenues and that you have a, a balanced budget there. Um, make sure you take a look and determine what expenses are eligible and ineligible. Funders are gonna have that listed in their guidelines. Arts organizations, more likely not, but they'll let you know uh, after you submit if any of the expenses can't be covered. Um, in terms of items you can include, as uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, Carfac RAV fees, make sure you, to pay yourself if uh, artist fee isn't indicated within uh, as a baseline, um, material costs, venue equipment rentals, in, uh, event and reception expenses, um, things like in-kind donations. So that's like donated space, time, services. That's a particularly good way to indicate the real cost of your project, even if folks are doing it for free to list that, that volunteer contribution. Um, so with, with this, you also should know that you have resources, you have folks that can um, support you in this. And please, please, please reach out to programming staff or funding officers if you have questions and look at the call and contact the person listed on the call if you have questions or the programming staff if they don't have anyone listed. Um, these are public organizations staffed by public servants and they're there to help you. Um, so, you know, don't, don't feel like you're being burdensome. Just pick up the phone and give them a call if, if need be. 
uh, and accommodations I wanted to touch on briefly as well. Um, so funders and arts organizations are definitely beginning to realize that proposal and grant writing structures are not accessible to all and have started offering accommodations to ensure equal access and opportunity. This differs organization to organization, but what I'd suggest is to reach out to funders or arts organization staff and ask if they'll accept alternative submission proposals if, if that's something that would be helpful to you. So an example being something like a, a video or an oral submission versus a written submission. Um, if English is your second language, ask if they'll pay for translating your grant or they'll either provide funding for you to translate it or translate it themselves. Um, so these are things that you know you should you should ask. You should know your rights and um, and and really look to those who are embedded in the organization to support and help you uh, as you go through and, and, and look to work with them and partner with them really. So I'm gonna wrap it up there because honestly, I could go on and on, but I know I've gone a bit over time. Um, and I know we want to open it up for questions and answers now so we can um, really explicitly directly uh, answer some of the things you're interested in hearing about. So with that, I'll uh, welcome Chris and Lindsay back. That was wonderful. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, I wish I would have had this advice many years ago. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I feel like when I was sort of just finishing um, school that I kind of cast such a wide net that I just became completely overwhelmed uh, and had difficulty sort of focusing in. So I really appreciate um, your kind of suggestions of how to focus um, what we're applying for. I wonder if either of you have any tips on um, CVs, what to include, um, what to focus on, and maybe, you know, if we're just starting out in a practice um, and maybe, you know, your CV is a little bit short, maybe what are some things we can do to help? I was gonna pass it to Chris first. Yeah? Hold on, okay, just wait. Okay, your CV is your calling card and always direct your CV to what you're applying for. So if you're applying for exhibitions, try to show that you've had some kind of exhibition. Um, we never lie on a CV, but you can always make sure that you're bringing the most out of any opportunities you've had. Remember, we're all starting someplace. Um, for we all have to start someplace. So sometimes even if your CV is one page or half a page in length, that's just fine. You have to start someplace. So start off, but show them that you know what you're trying to do. So applying for exhibitions, even show that you've been in maybe fundraisers, group shows in school, different sorts of opportunities that you've had to just give them an idea of where you are in your career. And so if you're starting out, the things you're probably gonna focus on is your education and your exhibition record, because those are probably your most important things that you have. As you probably become more a senior artist, your education probably gets goes back a bit further into for mine it's probably on my third page because it's not as important for what i'm doing now where i graduated from because now it's decades ago so the first part you always put your most important foot forward so your most recent things and the things that are geared towards what this opportunity is so think about it if you're applying for a public art uh you know call or something like that i always list my previous public art things at the very beginning so that's the first thing they're going to see so i always think of a cv as this big truckload full of stuff and material and things about myself and i just change it around and i also don't put every little pile into a CV for a directed call. That's what I do. Sue, what do you do? It's, uh, that's really, I think that's a really great overview and some really great advice. I'm a terrible person to ask this because 
I uh, a lot of the conversations we've been having at the new gallery and uh, with with peers is just get rid of it. Uh, honestly, it's the least interesting part of the submission package for me. Um, when I'm when I'm looking at submissions, I'm like, okay, proposal, really interested in the proposal. Uh, the images, really interested in seeing the past work, uh, really interested in hearing the artist's statement and, and their, their, how they're thinking about uh, how all of this comes together. The CV, I mean, it, it's nice, uh, as you said, to see and have it demonstrate that they've, they've, artists have done xyz before and you know we we can have confidence that they're able to successfully uh work through another the, this project but i think there's a lot of other ways you can you can demonstrate that so really for calls that i've been a part of lately um, including things like job calls we haven't required cvs um, and they've been an optional component and i'd love to see organizations move more towards that um, because uh, as much as it, it's nice to be able to have that record of, of um, achievements and past accomplishments, I also think that, um, like you said, everyone's starting somewhere, um, but a lot of folks who might be coming to their practice um, in a less linear route, say, than coming to art, from art school, then showing and or going to grad school, some who might be going alternative routes uh, are making just as exciting and interesting work. And um, maybe their CV uh, doesn't tell that same story in that same way. So I, I'd like to see us uh, have a little bit less weight on this, this particular document. Uh, thanks for that, Sue uh, and Chris. Um, yeah, I guess I, I would also kind of echo that Sue, I'd never really thought about it much before. <laughs> um, but when I've been on juries and, and things like that, it's also, um, you know, not not something that I really often kind of consult or is not really like a, you know, kind of real deciding factor of whether or not I'm interested in an artist's work as well. Um, Right. So any advice that you could give emerging artists on speaking about their work in proposals that is clear, succinct, um, audience acknowledging and gets beyond art and academic jargon? OK, uh, let's just let's just start that about um, always, you know, as Sue suggested, it's always or I think she suggested it's always important to have one or two people actually read over what you're writing, okay? Um, always get somebody to read your work who doesn't even know what kind of work you do. So if I can explain my story to somebody, I start with digital work and then I turn them into watercolors. If somebody can actually understand that who actually doesn't know my work, then I know I've done a really, really good job of communicating that. So it's always important to have multiple readers whenever you are doing something, especially things like proposals, artist statements. It's so important to get, uh, you know, people who don't have the art education and also people who aren't familiar with your art practice to read it. See if you can create a, uh, a picture in words that they actually know what you're doing. Then you know you have been successful. And I think that's a practice that you have. Calls for submission, grant writing is a way that you as an emerging artist are developing what's called your artist plan or your business plan. By actually writing about these things, whether you're successful or not, what you're doing by writing these things out is you're getting to know yourself, you're getting to know your artwork. And that is just so important. Uh, you're not going to, on your first attempt at writing, actually create something that's marvelous, uh, something marvelous to read. You have to do this over and over and over again. And so by constantly writing about what you're doing, getting people to read it, to, to look at it, you're going to get to the basis of what you're doing. It's going to give you ideas also about what your next step is, what your next step is along your art path. You are creating kind of like a business or an art plan when you do this. So keep at it. That, that's what I'd probably say. 
That's awesome advice, Chris. I 100% agree. I typically go through at least three or four drafts of a, of a proposal, a letter, a grant before before it gets finalized. And I, I have a couple of readers look at it as well. It's um, that's really helpful. I'm lucky that my my partner is not in the arts and he does a lot of a lot of reading reading for me, um, which is always really nice because he'll tell me like uh, he'll tell me like it is and uh, let me know when I've just gone off into jargon land. Um, but I guess one thing to really ask yourself when when you're writing is, can I say this in a simpler, more straightforward way? And if the answer is yes, work towards that. And I say this, and at the same time, I've received some incredible proposals that fully utilized poetry and completely like won me over and melted me. And maybe they weren't the, the simplest, uh, most straightforward, but there was such a resonance and connection with their practice and their their way of working that those have those have really spoken to me. So I guess that what I'm trying to say with that is that there's an, the other piece is use your own voice. We don't, people don't want to read something that sounds like any anyone could have written it that they all looked at through the thesaurus or used the you know gmail's like ai function to write it or i can't remember what that one tool is that you're grammarly grammarly um no no one wants to read that they want to read something in your voice they want to have see feel the personality feel your practice come through in the proposal in the artist statement so try to be clear and concise and be simple and plain language. Plain language is key. Don't don't make anyone reach for the dictionary when they're reading your proposal. Just, you know, try try to explain the con if, if there's complex concepts that you're exploring through your practice, that's awesome. Break it down for them within the proposal, within the artist statement. Define it for them within that document so that they can just stay within that. They can focus on it and really read and have a very clear holistic understanding of what you're getting at by the end of by the end of the page. Thank you. Um, so you've both mentioned, you know, sort of having, um, you know, friends or family you know, read it for you. Um, Sue, you also mentioned in your presentation, maybe exchanging um, work. Um, you mentioned it in the context of a photographer, but you know, could probably help with writing too. But do either of you know of any um, like services to help write like submissions or grant applications? Obviously, there are professional grant writers and things like that. I mean, I always would, you know, if English is not your first language, if you're not comfortable and you know something can be and you and and if there isn't accommodation made, like sometimes, you know, like with municipal grants right now, you know, you can do it as a recording or some other way or find some other way that's uh, accessible to you or something like that it's probably better to go that route. But, you know, the only time I think you should be trying to use somebody is if somebody totally understands and you're doing so many of these and they really know what you're trying to say. So if English is really a problem and you want to do this in English, maybe you should think about getting somebody that can help you with the language barrier or whatever barriers you had. But as Sue suggested, this really should be in, in your language. It should be your voice. What somebody reading these proposals or making judgments on, the things that I wanna be is I wanna see new work and I wanna be surprised. I'm not gonna be surprised if I read something that's written exactly like all other proposals. That's not gonna work for me. Sue, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I, I mostly see professional grant writers in the context of working for organizations versus with an individual. Um, that being said, I, I was trying to like pull back in the archives here. I can't remember the name of it, but I have seen some like peer mentorship groups pop up here and there throughout time. So um, 
essentially like uh, either a program that could be offered like by a service organization, like for instance, Carfac or uh, Elephant Artist Relief, where a group of artists might come together and workshop a text, a proposal, something like that. I have seen workshops like that offered in the past. I can't remember the exact, I think Elephant Artist Relief was one of them, but um, keep an eye out for different service organizations for activities like that, because that's a really awesome opportunity as well. It's like an, an equitable, equitable trade in terms of, you know, everyone's showing up with the expectation they're going to read somebody else's proposal, give feedback and, uh, and vice versa. And so that's a really, really nice model when that can happen. I've also seen professionals in the sector, especially in, in recent years, um, volunteer time essentially as a, a peer mentorship activity as well. Um, I can't think of any that are currently um, have openings or availability for that, but it's something to connect and be and look to your community for. There's a couple different um, community groups. Like I know that, like on Facebook, there's a Calgary artist page, or um, you know, there's a different. There's a, a early career. I'm sorry, an emerging arts administrator uh, meetup group as well here. Um, so depending on where you're based, there might be a local group of folks already coming together to share best practice, to share tips and tricks and advice. And it might be a really great place to um, start making those relationships with other folks in your field to um, exchange, exchange labor in this way. Mm -hmm. Oh, those are great tips. Um, something that uh, neither of you mentioned in your your presentations, but I'm curious to know about um, is what you think about submission fees for submissions. I know it's something that you know is less common in Canada, and so it's maybe you know more if you're applying to opportunities in the states or in Europe. Um, although it does happen in Canada too, so maybe you could just uh, share a little bit of you know what you think about fees um, and kind of how that might weigh on, you know, deciding to apply. I could probably start on that. Anyway, that is kind of mentioned in best practice documents, okay? And in the one that's called Organizing a Juried Art Show, when in earlier renditions of, uh, of this, I mean, the ones from maybe Saskatchewan and other places in Canada, they kind of said, under no circumstances should a fee be charged or, or, or paid for. Right now, we've kind of uh, changed it slightly because of things like the Salt Spring Art Prize or something where they might charge a small fee of, say, $30 or mm -hmm. something like that. So we have not precluded that you should never do this, but really think very much, what is this fee for? What is it doing? What kind of organization is this? If you're going to be applying to the Museum of Digital Art in Los Angeles or something, where that's exactly the way they make money because they get thousands of people paying fees of $35 and $50 US to, to go into a building that's the size of this room that I'm in right now, uh, I wouldn't do it, okay? So you have to absolutely, totally research what you're doing and I probably wouldn't recommend anybody paying fees of over $35 or $40, and that's only if necessary. Think of some print biennales and stuff like that. They all have fees. Things like the Salt Spring or Salt Spring Island Art Prize, it has a small fee attached to it. So I'd consider those, but I'd always make sure I do my research first to make sure that it's going for what they say it's going for, and it's going for a good cost to maybe pay somebody to administer if they didn't have a lot of grant funding and they want to administer this prize. Make sure it's it's going to work for you and you're not just paying money out that you're not going to get anything back from. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, I, I think that that's a, that's a good lens. For me, it's very... Um, I might It might be a little less... A little less forgiving, possibly. Um, <laughs> I, my, I have two camps here. One is that um, if they are publicly funded, I think it's inappropriate to ask ask for the fee. Um, I think if they have in Canada, we have access to resources uh, in a different way. 
uh, different types of resources. And I, I feel like it is uh, then say in the states, like say private sector and foundational money in the states versus public sector funding here. Um, I think that organizations that are receiving public sector funding here um, should work into their budgets uh, in, to ensure to offset those, those application costs. And um, to a point that came up earlier, uh, if they're not paying CARFAC fees I and they are receiving public funding, I would research that as well and be a, a fairly concerned. Um, and and not that would be my deal breaker in terms of would I apply to this call? If they're not paying CARFAC fees and they're publicly funded, that might be a line for me. Um, that being said, I, I take the point and I wanna recognize a lot of um, emerging and grassroots organizations um, that are just starting out and don't have those resources yet. Uh, I have a lot more forgiveness for um, organizations that you know artists are just starting up and they're they're doing it off of you know one small project grant they don't receive operational funding um that are it's a, a limited term project i i can understand that and i think it's important to support um organizations that are in those emerging stages as well because there's not a, there's not been historically a lot of room in the operating uh, funding market for those organizations to really kind of set up. But I, I think my distinction really is: Are they receiving operating funding and are they publicly funded uh, in in that significant way? And if so, I, I have a hard line. Um, I don't like to see it because honestly, artists are. Uh, if we look at the surveys, the wage surveys, artists are typically not making enough to have to at, at showing at these places to really justify the the application fee in my perspective, mm -hmm. in my opinion. I have to say, Sue, just on that, I, I, I've never paid, you know, many application fees in my life I because I, 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 I refuse to, because I agree with you on, on, on those sorts of things, but I do agree with you on emerging organizations and things like that they probably have to do so in the start. So you really have to, to do some research to find out what this fee is for. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for that. That's, that's great advice and good things to think about. Um, it looks like our, our chat's just slowing down a little bit, but um, a question that I wanted to ask for the two of you that maybe uh, we'll just give people just a couple more minutes to put any last questions that they have in, in the chat. But do you have any advice um, for what happens when you apply for something and you don't get it? Either, you know, pragmatically, emotionally, uh, any sort of advice for, for that situation? Not getting something is always really, really hard. Um, it, you know, because we, we apply to things and we always are kind of hopeful. It's kind of like you have things out there. But what I find is that it's always best to have sometimes like more than one thing out there at one time for the reason that we don't always get everything we don't you know if you just have one thing out and you're putting all your hopes and into one submission or one call i think you're going to be more likely disappointed but if i have like five things out at one time or five things out uh, i'm not as devastated when one comes back or two comes back and i don't get something uh, we're in a very there's so many artists that are out there that are really really deserving that should be shown so i'm at a probably stage where i just look at it and i probably don't worry as much but you know you really have to think about what is out there and always try to have a few kind of ideas out there in different places so that you always have something to hope for this so something isn't going to totally break you down from your emotional high because somebody rejected you as artists we get rejections all the time and we have to kind of not look at them as a kind of uh negative but rather 
There's just something that somebody didn't want us right at this one point in time. Maybe our work is too far ahead of its time or just not exactly what they were looking for. So you have to think about that that was not necessarily probably exactly the right call for you anyway. So keep, keep, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep active, keep making art, keep submitting to things, and you are going to be successful as long as you keep doing it. That's what I'd say. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, um, it, it's a great question. And I guess I'd, I'd start with, uh, and, and Chris said this as well, but you're not alone. Um, lots of artists receive rejections. And if you think about the call you've applied to, the you're in the majority. The majority of folks did not get accepted to this the, to to the opportunity because there's there's what six to ten exhibition slots they might be filling or project slots that they might be filling and they've received even if they've received a smaller pool say fifty applicants that's uh, you're still in the majority and I to to Chris's point of. It might, it might not be a, a good fit. It's not that it's, I would say that in terms of not taking it personally, you can think about how is this project that you want to do more aligned with another organization and, and go out there and look for an organization where it might be a better fit and, and work towards that next opportunity. And also if you like feedback, some of us do, some of us don't. Um, and it doesn't explicitly say on the call, we do not give feedback. If you like feedback and it doesn't say that, ask for feedback. That is a great, great way to learn, a great opportunity to learn and, and get some a sense of either um, some editorial support. Oh, we, we didn't select your proposal because um, we didn't understand X, Y, Z. And then you know to be more clear on that moving forward. Or, you know, we didn't accept your proposal because it was great, but we had so many great applications and try again next year because we really, really want to see you again. So that communication piece, remember what we were talking about earlier, these folks are in it because they love art. They're work, you hope, they're working at these places because they love art, they love artists, they want to support you, they want to be in conversation with you. And so ask for that feedback if uh, if it's, if that door has been opened, it's, it's a, uh, important way to do uh, do something that is a little bit uh, strengthened in the future. And in terms of, yeah, persevering, um, you know, it, it is an important aspect of this. Um, for every, every handful of applications you put in, maybe one is successful. Uh, there was an artist, from, I can't remember their name, but I saw a show once, many, like a decade ago, um, where the artist showed all of their rejection letters and they had drawn on them and turned them into work. And it was, I think their name was Heather. Um, anyways, the, the exhibition was really empowering in my opinion. And I, I thought it was incredible to, to see how they embraced the fact uh, and were transparent with their peers about the fact that, look at all these rejections I received in this show that I was successful for. And just keeping that in, in the back of your mind that we all go through it. Um, and it doesn't mean that your work's not any good. It just means that it wasn't the right time and place for it to happen. And, and next time maybe it will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and definitely I'd, I'd also say there's lots of times that I've been on uh, various juries and, and reviewing applications for things and maybe you know, an artist wasn't perfect for that opportunity, but it's an artist that I've, you know, wanted to work with for, for something else. And so I think, you know, even if you're not getting exactly what you applied for, you're still getting your work in front of all of those jurors who, you know, might remember you down the line or want to work with you for something else. Um, so the question here about um, applying for international submissions and is there anything particular to watch out for? I think, you, you know, we kind of described a little bit about, you know, in the American model there there might be fees and so maybe that's a different, but um, is there anything that either of you can think of um, specifically for, you know, other international calls? 
find out about the money, about the costs, about insurance. Are you going to get your artwork back? Can you trust this organization? Like if you're if you're sending your work over to Pakistan or to Belgium, are you going to get your work back? Do they have a record of doing that? It's hard for me to sue somebody in Belgium or in Pakistan. So I have to really have a lot of trust for this organization in order for me to even want to do that. A lot of problems occur internationally like over borders because we can't really sue. We'd have to go there. I mean, you know, if I have a gallery or if I had a gallery in Las Vegas, well, the, obviously the last uh, 19 months I couldn't have visited them. Can I trust them? You have to really have a lot more trust when you're going outside your province to, to be able to be sure that things are going to work out for you. Remember, you know, even if you have a contract, what happens when somebody goes bankrupt? If we have a if there's a bankruptcy in a gallery, say in Edmonton, I might be able to find out about it and get my work out. But if something happens and I have work in a New York gallery that goes bankrupt, I've lost all that work. So I would say internationally, you use a lot more caution. Yeah, it definitely has more complications and um, absolutely agree. Vetting is incredibly important. Look online research them as much as possible. See uh, if you know somebody who's shown there, see if you can talk to them about it. Um, because uh, honestly, like that, that kind of firsthand experience would be helpful. Uh, but I think vetting is really important. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you, like you're, you're signing an agreement, and there has to be a level of trust there. Things happen. Uh, places do go bankrupt. We can't predict these things. Um, is it the majority of places? I certainly hope not. Um, but it, it, that caution approach with caution is absolutely key. I, I wholeheartedly recommend you you uh, embrace embrace that um, strategy that Chris has outlined. Uh, another thing I think to consider would just be um, visas. If you're going there for a longer term, a, a residency, or even a shorter term install, make sure your paperwork is in order. You don't want to, um, you know, miss your opening or miss install or or lose half your residency because visa paperwork is uh, backlogged. Um, hopefully, if they're an organization that frequently is hosting international artists, that's very uh, a very straightforward process for them. But again, going back to your contract, make sure those responsibilities are delegated and outlined. Uh, international shipping of artwork can be a total pain. Um, it can be really, really complicated, I think, because a lot of shippers don't understand um, don't understand necessarily the valuation of art. And if you don't have a commercial practice, um, and maybe you don't have a history of selling work, being able to demonstrate that value for customs, even if you're not selling work at the show on the other side can be incredibly complex. So give yourself lots of time and do lots of research on that end as well and make sure the staff have uh, have touched base on that and are, are prepared for that, that aspect, especially if you're shipping a lot of uh, physical artwork. Um, the last thing is just on the budget piece, make sure you understand kind of the exchange rate. And there's been a lot of fluctuation of the dollar lately. And um, just when you're building that budget that you're you're giving yourself a little bit of a buffer and understanding um, how the exchange rate might impact uh, the resources you're actually receiving at the end of the day. Great advice. Thank you to both of you. Um, Right, so um, before we wrap up, do either of you have anything you'd like to add before we kind of close for the evening? We're uh, a bit over over an hour now. I would just say keep making the art. It's <laughs> important to keep making the art and to, if it interests you, try and find an audience for your art. And a good way to do that is to call for submissions because remember, places are always looking for things that are new ideas and new ways of thinking about the world. And that's probably what your art has. So you just have to find the right fit for what you're doing. 
honestly, I, I can't say it better. So all I'll say is thank you all for being here and for listening and for asking such great questions today. Um, and thank you again to Chris and Lindsay for, for sharing this conversation um, and, and to everyone who has supported this behind the scenes. Um, really, really appreciate it. And uh, yes, have a wonderful evening. Thanks so much. Good night, everybody. Good night and thank you.